Isn't this interesting? If you listen to what the witnesses have said and what's been said on the Republican side of the table, you wouldn't even know what the nature of SB 8 is. For them, it's just a routine Supreme Court procedural decision. It has nothing to do with the substance of the bill that was before the Supreme Court. You have to ignore the statement by Sotomayor that this was flagrantly unconstitutional, which ought to give a special moment to a decision, whether it's going to be a shadow docket or a merits docket decision, wouldn't you think? And to argue that this shadow docket is just routine, it just happens, nothing to see here, move along, the numbers don't tell that story. Eight times in 16 years, the shadow docket was requested and used by Obama administration and Bush administration. Eight times, 16 years. And then when it came to the Trump administration, 36 times in four years, and the Trump Justice Department won in 28 cases. So when Justice Breyer, decide, Justice Breyer decides to write a book, and Justice Barrett decides to go to the McConnell Center in Louisville, Kentucky, and argue that no politics, we're just playing them straight, call them as we see them, and then you look at this, it, it, it defies description. Perhaps now some other members on the other side will actually try to defend SB8. I'm anxious to hear it, but so far, not a one. Let me ask you, uh, Ms. Howard, you were present at the scene of this legislative crime. Uh, when we talk about the liability under SB8, it's been suggested that it, including categories of people who aid and abet uh, in, in the performance or inducement of an abortion would be the clinic and its employees, doctors, receptionists, security guards, relatives or strangers who pay for the abortion, donors to Planned Parenthood, insurance companies, they're expressly mentioned in the statute, those, I suppose, providing transportation to and from the clinic, counselors, including clergy, if we're talking about the potential civil liability of a minimum of $10,000, was this discussed in the Texas House of Representatives as to the, the number of people who would be inadvertently swallowed up in this law? It was absolutely discussed and debated, uh, but to no avail could we get any change made to that. And we have heard of multiple instances now of for instance, uh, Uber or Lyft drivers not being willing to take someone to uh, a Planned Parenthood clinic. Uh, this is something that ha has a, an extreme amount of confusion. Uh, people do not know if they're going to be held liable for even counseling. Uh, those that are doing sexual assault counseling in particular are upholding what they know is appropriate to do in counseling those that come to them, the survivors, but are have absolutely concerned now about what that's going to mean for liability for them. Long time ago, I used to be a practicing lawyer filing civil litigation lawsuits. Uh, and this bill has something in it I have never seen before. The defendant has the burden to prove that they did not break the law. Not the plaintiffs proving that the law was broken. They've completely flipped the burden of proof. If I'm sued, now I have to prove that I didn't, I didn't break the law. Think about that for a second. It's exactly the opposite of normal legal practice. The burden is on the accused, not on the accuser. Was that discussed when the Texas House of Representatives debated this law? Of course it was discussed, and, and we tried to make changes there as well. Uh, the fact is that that's what I'm hearing from many physicians that I've spoken with, that they are talking about retiring, leaving the state. Uh, they are somewhat risk averse to begin with, and uh, they're not going to risk their profession by being sued, something that, that they may not have even done. Uh, so there is, it's absolutely chilling. So there's no rape or incest exception in this law, correct? That's correct, that's correct. Except there's one reference to rapist that I can find. And that reference says that no exceptions for victims of rape to be able to sue under this law. So the Texas House of Representatives decided, well, we aren't going to create a, an incest or rape exception, but wait a minute. We're not going to let the rapists turn around and sue under this law and recover from their own victims. So was that discussed in the Texas House of Representatives? Again, yes. We tried to amend that uh, to get better coverage so that we would make sure that rapists were not allowed to sue at all. Uh, the fact is, though, that because there's no exception for incest and rape, 
is egregious on its face, but what it also says to us is that in order for you to, uh, to be protected here, if we're going to look at rape and incest, then we're saying you have to be assaulted first in order to get your constitutional rights. So this is really, the, the entire bill is, is just egregious.